Hey guys, I'm back. Uh, I was going to give you the day off and honestly, uh, probably did in a way because it's so late in the evening when I'm recording this that uh, you probably won't see it <coughs> until tomorrow or whenever. Um, well, it's relatively late at night, but I think, I think the music here is uh, subject matter at least suited. I'm playing in the background and you're probably not going to hear it is uh, Ehrlich by Klaus Schultz, uh, probably my favorite album by him, certainly uh, late night listening, it's a little hard to listen to during the day, it's, it's pretty abstract, dark stuff, so this is the time of day that it's perfect for. Uh, I was debating whether or not to do a Klaus Schultz video, and I was going to do an Icon album, my Icon album series that I've done a couple albums with, and it probably deserves it because um, my first album by him, which would have been the Icon album, is Time Wind. Probably my second favorite album of his. First thing I ever bought by him. This is the original vinyl I bought. Um, you know, I was a little hesitant to do this video only because the music I listen to and the musicians I listen to are pretty obscure, and amongst the things I listen to, probably the two best known musicians you know, that in my world are almost like pop musicians, it's almost like doing a video on the Beatles, um, is uh, Tangerine Dream and Klaus Schultz. So many people have this album, and so many people have shown this in the VC, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that I can really add anything to it. Um, what can I say? It's a great album, classic sequencer album for the first part anyway. Um, great cover great back cover. Smart move, uh, showing all the previous albums, um, because uh, it makes you want to buy more if you like it. How I got into Klaus Schultz was uh, back in the record days, probably 77 I want to say, um, and that is before I got into jazz and modern classical music and avant-garde and even electronic music, really. Um, you know, I was a rock fan, and then I kind of went to progressive rock and was trying, uh, attempting to find things that are more out there progressive-wise, and it even drove me to buy, um, I remember, I think they, their name was Ange, a, uh, I could be wrong, a French progressive rock band that sung in French, that had long instrumental passages. Uh, I would kind of, uh, compare them maybe to, uh, a bit of this 1970s Genesis, whatever this French band was, which I, I, I think Ange was the name, I'm not sure. Uh, not not so much musically, they were a progressive band, but um, they uh, had vocals that were in French, so I couldn't understand a word of it, which was a little frustrating, but, but like Genesis in the 70s, very long instrumental sections, which I got into, um, because I had pretty much exhausted a, a lot of, well, certainly what I knew of the progressive world, and... I was finding new bands, but I don't know, I wanted something something more. And I guess at that time I started feeling that um, music could be more than kind of my perception of it. You know, when you get out of the rock thing, uh, you know, which is a, a lot about rhythm and energy and stuff like that, uh, I began to kind of realize that, well, music can be anything for any time. It could be something to be listened to. Um, when you don't know what you want to hear or more abstract instrumental things. I started being drawn to the idea of instrumental things. And I probably bought, possibly, um, at this time or prior to this, probably some, a, a couple, you know, all instrumental fusion things, which oddly I was very disappointed in because I found them too aggressive. Uh, I was looking for things that were a little more impressionistic, but all instrumental. And if you could imagine, one of my favorite albums of that time, and probably my favorite rock album of that time, is, um, of all time, was uh, Genesis, uh, Wind and Weathering. And I was looking for um, kind of instrumental music, like, like Wind and Weathering without the vocals. And, you know, and maybe even that was uh, even more abstract or impressionistic musically, and not finding it. And now when I was looking at these bands, like, for instance, like a Return to Forever or Mahavishnu Orchestra or something, I was thinking, well, that would be the next level. But what I heard was extremely loud and raucous stuff, 
true, it was instrumental, didn't have the vocals, but it didn't have that, that beauty and the, the classical and acoustic edge that something like Wind and Weathering had, if you're familiar with that album. So it kind of I kind of felt like oh, I discovered that stuff too late. That would have been better when I was into the rock stuff, and I was kind of looking to expand my horizons. Now, this was a few years, maybe two years, before I actually started uh, appreciating artists in the ECM roster and in the jazz world and, and, and uh, things like that, uh, shortly before my discovery of Terry Riley. And um, yeah, I first discovered, as I mentioned, ECM through the Bar Phillips album and um, a Three Day Moon, which had electric guitar and synthesizers on it. Uh, and, and, I, and I progressed from there. But a couple years before, um, I, you know, I discovered this. And the only reason I discovered this was because I was haunting the record shops. This is one of those things that, you know, you would come across uh, at the time. The Sam Goody store, which was very large, uh, that was about 10 miles from my home, had an enormous import section. Huge. I mean, records were huge anyway. Um... But the import section was particularly hu huge, and I learned that um, the the guy that ran the import section and was responsible for ordering the stuff apparently was a, found, a fan of, you know, basically Krautrock, you know, Tangerine Dream, the Klaus Schultz time. So Klaus actually had his own section there, and not too many artists did. Most of the imports were, uh, you know, generic letter M, letter N, letter S, you know, and you'd have to look under there. Um, but a few of the larger artists had their own section. Klaus Schultz is one of them, and I'm just flipping through miscellaneous everything. And, you know, you get caught by the record cover. Um, then when I started reading, and I realized that there's only two tracks on here, each one is a full side long track, and it appeared to have been written and played entirely by one musician. That turned me on because I was intrigued by the idea of just one musician going into a studio and creating an album entirely, entirely on his own, so that everything came from his mind and his hands and everything. And that idea to today is still a fascinating one to me, one person doing everything. And what I didn't know, because they didn't list the, the, uh, the running length, but you know what I didn't know, which would have also turned me on even more, would be the fact that one side is 28 minutes long and another is 30 minutes long. So you have two pieces, 128, 130 minutes, wow, just I'm there. You know, because I was looking for something to get lost in, something that was long and that you spent a lot of time with and you could lose track of time. Funny story is, naturally, you know what, I don't recall my first impressions. I, I pretty much liked it right away. In a way, the music is very much like the cover, like the internal art, like the external art, everything. You know, it's like that. It has that kind of futuristic, uh, alone on a planet kind of vibe to it, you know, very much, you know, very much 70s synthesizers, sounds great, sounds great even today, um, and I like that. At the time, in my, in my bedroom, I had, uh, at, right at the head of my bed, right, I, where my pillow was, right in front of that, was my stereo receiver, so I didn't even have to get out of bed, all I had to do was extend my arm a little bit to change the volume on the stereo receiver. On top of the stereo receiver was the turntable. So you couldn't get much closer than that. And I can remember when I first got this album, laying down in bed, playing it, you know, played both sides of it, getting into it, and then um, went back to side one, I don't know, whatever Beirut's return is on, side one, yeah, side one, um, which is the classic sequencer piece, which I still love to this day. Um, and just playing that as I actually went to sleep that night at a lower at a lower volume. It went on for 30 minutes so you could fall asleep, and if I wasn't asleep at the end of it, all I had to do was press the button, just barely reach out from the top of my bed there where I was playing, um, and just touch a button to get the uh, record to, to play again through that 30-minute side. So it was a great thing to go to sleep to. It was probably one of the first things I ever bought that you could kind of sleep to at a low volume. It certainly wasn't in the rock world, and there's no drums. There's just keyboard synthesizers. And oddly enough, my, my first few um, purchases of Klaus Schultz uh, didn't have any drums on them, as his early albums did probably, 60% of them maybe had drums on them. 
So my initial impression was of somebody that didn't use drums at all, which I think suits the music, um, because I did get slightly disappointed later on, you know, as I as I discovered things that um, were more percussion oriented and kind of lost that floaty vibe for me. But anyway, I mean, I love this right away. And I, I don't quite know the order, but I very quickly went, you know, on and... Now, this is also... I keep showing albums, and I say, this is one of my favorite album covers of all time. But it is. Not only is this one of my, my favorite Klaus Schultz record, also very avant-garde, and no synthesizers, it's all electric organ, um, and Klaus manipulating it and using some tapes. But um, this was this one was a bit harder for me to get into because I was expecting more synthesizer stuff, and this is more abstract, um, more electric organ, which I'm I'm fine with, but it, you know it wasn't um, quite as high tech and futuristic sounding as Time Wind, which was fine. This was an earlier album. This was his, his first album, Time Wind. Time Wind, the one I just showed, was his fifth. Not only is that one of my favorite album covers and my favorite Klaus Schultz album. This is a fantastic picture. I absolutely love that winter that winter picture. There is that could be an album. It should, probably should be an album cover of its on itself by itself. I love that winter picture of the ice falling, and it's just or rather it looks essentially like it's hanging in the air, but it's not. Um, damn man, is that is that a pretty photo or what? And the the music isn't cold, but but it's it's wintry. It, it, it's and my favorite music has, an, generally to me, an autumn or winter feel. And this certainly fits the bill. I mean, this is kind of also alien sounding stuff, and it, it sounds like it's from a lonely planet, or you know, the, the, I don't know who took that that internal photo, but they but that's just so beautiful. It's just such an incredible photo. I'm glad I have this on 12 inch vinyl. Clearly, I have all these on CD. Um, and also, there was a habit of his. Uh, there's a few albums of, of Klaus's that in the early years had alternate covers. Uh, his first two albums were those, and I guess because they were issued on different record labels, they changed the cover. Uh, Ehrlich also has the um, the Alien cover that I think may be a little more better known. Uh, you know, the Alien kind of sitting on the planet, very very similar to the Time Wind uh, album cover, almost like a variation on that. Uh, there was that too, and there was this one, which I like. I can't say which one I like better because I like them both, but I really like the colors on this one. Um, and this just happened to be the edition that was there when I bought it. I think the next one, which also, by the way, that one doesn't have any drums either. Klaus uses electric organ solely on that, and apparently a tape of uh, an orchestra kind of like tuning up and playing some varying things, which he took the tape recording and altered it and processed it so it didn't s I actually played it backwards I think so that it doesn't sound like basically an orchestra tuning up and of course it's very impressionistic and avant-garde and experimental and out there anyway uh, I think this was the next one I bought which is which you know bounces around much later because this would be his ninth album and at the time that I got into him this was his most recent album uh, so this would be 70, this came out 77, I probably picked it up, I don't know, late 77, early 78, some sometime around there, uh, mid 78. And again, this was, uh, you know, obviously at this point he had gone all synthesizers. His first two albums featured uh, you know, the organ uh, manipulated, essentially. From the third album on he started using standard synthesizers. And I'm probably, I'm, I'm all telling you things you already know, and I'm wondering, this is, I'm wondering why I'm even doing this video. It's like showing a Beatles album. This is the Beatles' first album. This is the Beatles' second album. It, it almost seems pointless in a way. Um, but hey, uh, I know Carm is going to know every single thing that I'm saying here already, so he can predict it coming. But the only excitement will be that I'm showing these out of order, uh, in terms of the order they were originally uh, recorded and released in. Um, this was this was a f another fun one. This he also referred to as being a winter album, um, and it has a winter vibe to it, which it, it, it does to an extent, but I don't think as as much as um, Ehrlich to the first album or Time Wind to the uh, fifth album that I showed. Uh, this may have a, a winter vibe, but um, boy, Ehrlich's really got a cold winter vibe to it, which I which I like. 
this is this is a classic. This is another great album by him. So I, I went with to this day, um, these three albums could be even in his top three albums, even considering all the stuff he's recorded since then. I really think that his first ten albums um, really stand on their own, just kind of the first musical chapter in his life, starting with the eleventh one, which was Doom. Things changed a bit, and and that it would continue to change. Um, so his first ten albums were essentially like his first musical chapter. I always think of it that way. So this would be his uh, eighth one. Did I say that already? Yeah, I think this is his eighth album. I bought them out of order. So as you notice already, um, the first three albums of his that I picked up, out of the nine that he had out, were all albums that had no drums on them, which I liked about his music. Now, I remember when this came out, the double album set, uh, X, his tenth album, because I bought this as a new release. See, back before the internet age, you couldn't find out an album was coming out, um, and it basically just would be in the store one day when you went there, and that's what happened. I was into Klaus Schultz, trying to figure out which album to get next, and um, all of a sudden this was a new release. So this is the first one. This would be um, 1978. It may not have hit the shops that quick. It may have taken till 79, possibly. Um, could have been 78. This one's a little more worn. Um, but then again, this has, uh, you know, and this has been reissued several times on CD. The first CD edition well, it's a little inferior because I think they cut they cut some tracks or something, or, or the length of a couple of the tracks were cut because of some sound problems with the original. Uh, people have showed this, uh, and I don't recall who. Somebody on my very small subscriber list has shown this, I know. And the, the incredible thing is the, the booklet is still in excellent shape. Um, and the record coming from Germany was... was the, the outside was a little, I would say battered, but you know, it was pushed around a little bit. You could tell even when I bought it. Um, but the booklet is very much intact. Shows all his instruments. Uh, it's quite a nice booklet. So it shows his musical history, him as a drummer prior to becoming a keyboard player. And it was his tenth album. It shows all his um, prior albums up to that point, his nine prior albums. Very interesting, huh, folks? You know, I'm showing this, and I'm thinking everybody that was watching this knows this. Uh, I think this was the next one I got. I bought his first ten albums in fair, not not in order, but um, you know because I was I started in '77. Uh, it's they're all very close to each other. I didn't jump 20 years or anything. And this one, this one had a couple different covers too. I think. I seem to recall that, that this had an alternate cover without the nudie ladies. And the funny thing was, is um, I had, I'll never forget, I, I had asked for this for Christmas and put it on my Christmas list that year. And uh, my mother was less than thrilled by the album cover. Um, I did think of that. I should have just asked for another one. I think I knew what the album cover was, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, think, I think Volume 2 has a different cover as well. Uh, I know volume, you know, volume one is a whole separate album. This one, oh, by the way, X the, was the first time I heard drums in his music, and because it was a double record set, there was stretches that didn't have drums, but um, there were stretches that had drums. On X, they were recorded fairly well. On s later on, when I got into some of his earlier albums, and even this one, which was um, just number, let me see. This is actually his 10th album, the one that came out just before X. Wait a minute, X is his 10th album, so it must be his 9th. Hmm, I'm perplexed. Actually, yeah, yeah, this is his 9th album. This is his 9th album. Uh, I got thrown off because nowadays they list Moon Dawn under two different entries in his discography, and Moondawn's an earlier, uh, an early album, that was his sixth album. Um, 
But yeah, I think there was another cover for this one. This one had the drums, and this was the uh, prior to X when you do hear drums in this music. I have to be honest, they're not well recorded. Um, with the, all the electric keyboards being very, very well recorded on his albums, they sounded very high-tech at the time. And the problem was acoustic instruments weren't recorded as well on these albums, as if like, you know, maybe the engineer was better at recording electronic instruments than acoustic instruments, which is, uh, you know, a problem that exists almost to this day, um, where engineers that grew up solely with electric instruments aren't that well versed in, uh, you know, how to pick up acoustic instruments. And the drums on here tend to sound a little muddy. Now, in addition, both this and X, having drums for the first time, um, I was a little, I say, disappointed or so because I didn't know there was no place to read about his history. That a lot, in, that in fact, a lot of his albums have drums on them, and to me, it it roots the music differently. When whenever there's a drummer playing, for most people, you sit there and and you tap your foot or your finger or whatever, you're kind of focused in on the beat, and uh, not to the exclusion of everything else, but the beat is the thing you begin to follow. What I liked about the first three albums I bought, without the drums, you your attention could go any number of places. Even the sequencers, which are rhythmic, but they're not as kind of heavy-handed as drums are. And there's full drum kits on these, you know, on, on X and on this. And also, on this, and going back to his prior albums, like I said, the drums tend to be recorded, they're a little muddy, they're not that clear. And so you could tell that it was recorded in the 70s when you listen to it now. If you listen to just the keyboard albums, that's not always that clear. The albums without the drums, it, it's the way... To me, the drums are always a dead giveaway. If you're listening to an album and you're not sure what time period it was recorded in, um, the drums are almost a dead giveaway. The 70s drum kits had a certain sound, and the 50s and the 60s had different sounds. The 80s had different sounds. Um, so, so, and not only the actual sounds, but how they were recorded. Um, and so this isn't a favorite. This has some really nice Mellotron on here. And, you know, again, it has longer tracks. The, the first side is one track is 29 minutes for the first track. So it's, so it's really something you get lost in. But with the drums in there, there's a much more heavy emphasis on rhythm. And I prefer the floaty stuff. So, where did I go next? Next, I went back. Uh, sixth, is this the album after Time Wind? This is Moon Dawn. And this also had drums on it. Um, the drums are, oddly enough, slightly better recorded than Body Love Volume 2, which came later. And I think that's just up to the engineering. And the pieces aren't bad. And as you can see, 27 minutes, 25 minutes, so there's only two pieces again that are quite long. Um, it's good, but I have to admit, I didn't give this one a lot of spins because uh, because both of the pieces had drums on them, and it's really not what I want from his music. I found that this was probably something better for me to listen to, uh, I was making cassette tape copies of music that I liked to listen to in my car. Um, this would be one that I might bring in the car with me because of the rhythmic elements and drums being in here versus the ones that I sit and listen to at home. And especially with these early albums, I find the ones that I sit and listen to at home are the ones without the drums, where you can just kind of daydream and lull off to them and uh, change the focus of your attention in any number of places. This would be more one that, you know, it, it, because it pulses and it has the drum kit on here, um, you know, be more of a driving thing for me. Uh, I continued. I continued buying uh, Body Love One, which, again, a lot of drums in here. I'm not sure if this one, this might be the only cover, this one had an alternate cover, too. But again, you know, hey, I like a 27-minute track. But, um, honestly, I, you know, from, from like, I, I still, like I said, I, I separate his first ten albums. It's his first, kind of, like, his first chapter in life. Um, this is enjoyable. This is, this is also, again, a lot of drums, high, highly rhythmic. Uh, even up tempo at times, and so um, this would be more of a driving, more of a I listen to in the car kind of thing. I wouldn't listen to at home. Um, not a favorite. It's a lot better than some of the stuff he put out in the '90s. That's for sure. Here's a real oddity, and this one, 
think the album cover is better than the album. Um, this is Black Dance, actually his fourth album. You got the alien theme going on again, which I like. Um, this is the one that Klaus Schultz said himself out of his first ten albums or so. If there was one that he was just going to discard entirely and said it wouldn't have mattered if I had made that, that it would be this. And I could hear where he's coming from. Uh, I think it's the long, longest track, the, the one track that's on here that's the full side, is um, something where he played bongos uh, himself, apparently, and um, drums and acoustic guitar on it. And I think, uh, is this where the operatic, I think there might even be a snippet of operatic vocals in here. It doesn't really work. It isn't well recorded. It's a fairly poor recording. Um, both, both his third and fourth album, uh, Picture Music and Black Dance, uh, where he first started actually using synthesizers, but also used drums on them, tend to be a little thin sounding. The, the, the drums and percussion aren't well recorded. Um, not a not a great album. Not a great album. But uh, probably the one I've listened to the least, to be honest. And so, actually, right pretty much at that point, um, I took a bit of a reprieve, personally, from Klaus's music for a number of years. By the time I had gotten the, the last album I showed, The Body Love One, I also had started to discover uh, Bar Phillips and the ECM artists, and if you go and watch that video, I explain how you know one artist in ECM led to another, but also led to a different type of music. And so for quite a few years I was basically chasing down um, probably almost exclusively uh, ECM artists, even if it wasn't on uh, you know, actual ECM albums, it was uh, the artists that recorded for ECM but did things on the side like Miroslav Vitas and did albums for other record labels. But I got into a very, uh, after a couple of years of that, of listening to the ECM artists, I got to the point where I was listening to only acoustic music, believe it or not. And you know, somebody like Keith Jarrett is a purist and doesn't use or play electric instruments. And I was into Keith Jarrett and Oregon, the band, prior to them starting to use synthesizers in the mid-80s. Um, and I got to the point when for a number of years I only, only listened exclusively to acoustic uh, instrumentation. Very rarely did I venture into electric stuff, and it was not electronic stuff, it would be when an ECM artist like um, like maybe a John Sermon would um, have a little bit of synthesizer on one of his solo albums. And there wasn't a lot of electronics on there, it was just a little maybe synthesizer pattern that he would play horn solos over on a few tracks on an album. And I actually stayed away from electric instruments entirely for a whole bunch of years. And eventually, and I want to say seven, eight years maybe, something like that, maybe longer, and eventually, when I got slowly back into listening to more electronic instruments within the context of acoustic bands, I started getting a bit more into electronic music as well, and other aspects of electronic music, like early computer music and the Princeton Columbia album. I don't think I ever showed that. But, um, but I also decided to uh, go back and revisit Klaus Schultz and fill in some of the gaps on those early albums. And uh, so I did. I bought uh, Picture Music, which was his thir third album. And the funny thing is I have two copies of that here. And the reason I have two copies is because um, I wanted to get... I bought this one in the store, I think, first. And here's the other copy. I'm seeing double. Oh my god. Oh my god. Um, I wanted the original cover. I wanted to get the original artwork on the cover, which I'll, I'll show you, because it's it, it's a, an interesting little alien floating thing. It's that blue one. That's the original cover there, which is what I was attempting to get. So I had bought picture music in the store and then also by mail order, this is still prior to the internet, this is early, <laughs> probably mid to late 80s at this point. Um, I was attempting to get the original cover, and I thought that the mail order company version was that original cover, and then when it came by mail, 
it ended up being the reissue. This is the reissue uh, cover on Brain. Is this Brain? Yeah, it's, it's Brain Records. But this is uh, and I have my and I have my receipt actually taped to it, so I'm trying to read it. I bought this in '86. So I guess about 86 would have been when I got back into Cloud. Late, 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 late 86. So I had quite a few years there of uh, skipping around. Um, what I bought was filling in my gaps. And the one big gap of the, of the early albums, of the first 10 albums, was Cyborg, which was the second album, which was a two record set. Um, and again, this is still prior to the internet, so I didn't know what to expect. Uh, again, this is the last album he recorded without a synthesizer. He was using the electric organ. And I have mixed feelings about this album, which I, I, I like it quite a bit. There's something going on in this album. I like the fact that there's no drums on here. There's four sides. Each has a, a, a track about 25 minutes long, approximately. Um, not as good as Air like the first album. What it seemed like... Klaus was obsessed with at this time was more sound effects. He had, I, I read uh, somewhere where he was explaining how he recorded this, and he said that he had, uh, it was very basic, he had an electric organ, and he had an amplifier, and he was able to rig his amplifier up somehow that it got weird feedback sounds and sound effects that he could control. and. All four sides are almost filled exclusively with these sound effects. Um, and in the background, and that's all you hear, and it kind of, it can get annoying, or basically it sounds like it's a sound effect. It doesn't have that abstract beauty of Ehrlich, certainly, or even of Time Wind, which was his fifth album and came later. Um, the interesting thing is, if you listen close to this, there's a couple levels of things going on. And what I, the, the, the thing that you hear first upon your first five or six or seven listen is just those sound effects for each piece that are just in the forefront all the time. Uh, after a while, you begin to realize there's something, oh, there's this thing going on in the background. And if there's ever an album that I, I personally would like to remix, I'm generally against the whole concept of going back and, and doing a revisionist history and remixing. And I would like to remix, not in the sense now where they take new stuff and pile it on, but rather go back to the original tapes and bring up the stuff in the background or give an alternate mix of the music that's actually already there. I would love to take these tracks and put those sound effects way in the background to where they're almost inaudible because I hear things in here that sound like a Mellotron. They sound like Mellotron strings. And I'm not sure where that sound is coming from because Klaus didn't have a synthesizer at this time. So I don't know if he once again was able to take orchestral tapes, uh, recordings, and use them and process them. But if you're familiar with the groovy, one of my favorite sounds is the Mellotron string sound um, of those classic Mellotrons of the late 60s and 70s. Um, you, that's on here, but it's buried so far in the background that, it, that I, you really have to have good ears or be able to tune out the, the effects beeping and buzzing and flopping in your ears to really hear them. But there's this really beautiful thing going on in the background, and because Klaus didn't have a synthesizer back then, I don't know what instrument is... It certainly sounds like a Mellotron string. Um, but And it could be that um, Klaus did get an orchestra again to do some samples, and he's manipulating orchestral samples and processing them. Um, but man, would I love to just remix this, take out those effects, and see what else is there, because I'm a, maybe not the whole album, there's stuff in the background, but I can recall there's, there's things going on where I'm hearing what sounds like Mellotron strings, which is one of my favorite sounds in the whole world, and uh, I would love to hear what's, what's definitely below the surface there. But I didn't get this till I got back into Klaus back in the late 80s. This is one of those things, I'll let me fill a collection, and this is an inter certainly an interesting album. And even with the effects being up front, um, 
I still like it better than, than, than things like Body Love, which just, it, it's too rhythmic, it's too up-tempo. And um, I went um, beyond that, getting into his, his second, Klaus' second phase, um, which I have to admit, I, I, I skipped a few albums, but um, I didn't get um, some of those others. Uh, actually, uh, no, I don't think I'm missing anything out of the first, yeah, out of the first ten, now I had them all. Um, where it starts to change with the album, I guess, 11, which is um, with Dune, which I didn't buy Dune until much, 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 much later. Um, the first post-10 uh, album that I bought, the first one of what I would consider his, his, his second phase, um, and he even, you know, this is where he, he himself started changing, uh, Klaus Schultz' Trans Epper, which... Um, I like, uh, you know, it, I like the studio picture on there. <coughs> this was a this was a big change um, for a couple reasons. There's two long tracks on here, but they're both under 19 minutes. When you're used to 27 to 30 minute tracks, it was obviously a change. This is to, this is almost a pop song length compared to his his other works. Uh, he used a Wolfgang Typehold um, on cello for. Um, I'm not sure if this is the first time because he has a he has a bunch of guests on the X album on the Ten album, um, but this was probably the first time that the cello was so prominent. Pretty much used in a in a rhythmic fashion though. Um, this is also the first time I'm aware of, and certainly the first time I heard him use uh, Michael Shreve on drums versus the old drummer. Um, when Klaus Schultz did drums on his earlier albums, he either played the drums himself, uh, like on Picture Music. Or he used uh, Harold Grosskopf on drums, which is a drummer that, that uh, went back to his days, I guess, um, I guess the Eshra Temple years. Um, here, he used Michael Shreve, who was uh, the drummer for Santana. And Michael Shreve is a lot even more aggressive and up-tempo. And this is 1981, I think, yeah. And the, the mixing, the actual recorded sound of the drums is much, much better, but they're also way up in the mix, and they're extremely up-tempo and extremely aggressive, and it's very hard to pay attention to anything for me but the drums in here. And it sounds good. This was the really first uh, time that the drums were really well recorded, which leads some people to think that he's a better drummer than you know Harold Grosskopf was, which you know may or may not, be, I don't think is really the case but rather it's the, the sloppily recorded drums in the early albums that tend to make you really not appreciate what, how they're being played. This is, this is very good for driving. It's very, uh, you know, this is an album that you can get in the fast lane and you'd still, you know, you wouldn't be doing 10 miles an hour like I sometimes do with the quieter music I have listened to in the car. Um, but again, this is not where I wanted him to go. Uh, this, this is second, you know, this is second chapter Klaus Schultz. And... And for me, that second chapter never got back to the good, you know, the, the place where of the music that I loved about those first early albums that I picked up. Uh, this one is a movie soundtrack, and otherwise, it's a standard early '80s album. Uh, this is from '84, done to uh, a movie, a German movie. It's a movie soundtrack, so it's got shorter tracks, six minutes, nine minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes. Also now is shorter running time. All of a sudden, Klaus Schultz albums, which used to, you know, go somewhere in the 60 minute time frame, uh, all of a sudden are down below 40 minutes for a single album, like Trans Effort, like the one I showed. Um, and this is much like the, the prior one. There's drum machines and drums, which are more important even on this album than the keyboards. Uh, you could maybe say that that's because it's a soundtrack and the music maybe had to go in that direction for the movie, but it also seemed to tie in with the direction that Schultz was going in himself at the time. And there's really not much going on in here. The one good track on here is a sequence that actually came from his prior album, which is a really good keyboard sequence which is wonder a wonderful, pretty-sounding thing, but it was actually from the, the prior album, which was a 
proper non-soundtrack Klaus Schultz album, a double album set. And this would be uh, 83, this would be from Identity. And uh, got back to longer tracks slightly. Um, three sides here, uh, one side 21 and a half minutes, 24 and a half minutes, all one track, uh, 21 minutes, and almost 32 minutes. So when I saw that, I'm like, oh, oh maybe he's getting back to where I want him to go. Um, but it, it's it's better than the prior two albums, but the, it's very much in the same. It's like Trans Effer. It, it's like in that mode. It just happens uh, to have longer tracks. So there are moments that the drums calm down a little bit, and you can get sequences of, of keyboards. And uh, Wolfgang Taipold, the cello player from Trans Effer, returns. Mike Shreve is again on drums. So with him on drums, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of aggression there. Um, Rainier Bloss, this is the first uh, time that I was aware of him, who's also a keyboard player, who it says plays glockenspiel and sounds. And I don't know what sounds comprises here, because he's a keyboard player. Does he also play keyboards? It would be the first time that Klaus used another keyboard player on a studio album. I could see maybe bringing an additional keyboard player live when you're reproducing all these multiple overdubs. I was kind of surprised to see, especially with that sound, I tend to think that there's keyboards involved, um, that Klaus may not be the only keyboard player on the album. But from his second chapter in his music, I did... I had lesser expectations, let's be honest, but I did appreciate um, this a bit more than the, the prior couple albums. And I went back uh, and I did pick up Dune, which was his first album after X, after the 10th album, which was really the first album in his uh, second division. Uh, second chapter of his life, and um, this is an interesting edition of Dune, though, because for this is not the original uh, import or original German version. There was a record company around for a very short few years called Gramavision here in the United States that was primarily a jazz. I had a lot of jazz recordings from them at the time. And they seem to be doing exclusively jazz. And that's why I was surprised when I saw they're reissuing Klaus Schultz albums. This is odd. I wish they had used the original. They, they did some nice designs and stuff. But um, I wish they had reissued the original album covers from when they were released in Germany. But this is a very short period of time that... Uh, Klaus Schultz albums were actually released in the U.S. because all those prior albums you had to buy as imports from somewhere in Europe. Um, and here on Gramavision, it was a record label that's based out of uh, New York. And it was very surprising to see domestic Klaus Schultz releases. And it sure as hell didn't happen for long. Gramavision was only around for a few years. I don't know how many Klaus Schultz albums they put out. Um... And it's interesting, this is, I talked in an early video, this is one of the ones where I saved the receipt from, <laughs> from when I bought it. So, if you wanted to know what I was doing on January 24th of 1987, uh, at 5.02 p.m., I was in the Sam Goody store buying this disc, which oddly enough I remember. I remember being in Sam Goody and buying this, 1987. One of the things, like I said, I'm not sure how many albums of his Gramavision um, put out. But here's another one. You look, notice the similarity in the cover with the last one. Here's another Gramavision domestic. They, they all have circuit boards on them. Which I thought is interesting. They're not bad album covers. I just wish they would have put the original. But this album, which will confuse you if you look at the title is called Mind Phaser. It is not a reissue of a standard Klaus Schultz album like Dune was. Like they put out Dune, I guess just the way it originally came out, um, in uh, 
in its original edition in, in Germany. I'm not sure. Is Dune the one? I think Dune is the one that really turned me off for a long time. Um, I think Dune, is, I'm pretty sure Dune was the one that has Arthur Brown. There's only two long tracks on Dune, right? Uh, one of them has Arthur Brown on vocals, if I'm not mistaken. It's the first time I'm using it. Just improvising vocals, and they're horrible because they're at a, at a key and everything. And it turned me off to the album, and I never, I never listened to it for many, many years. Uh, yeah, there's one track on each side. And I remember years later, actually on the radio of all places, hearing a Klaus Schultz tune that I really liked from one of his early albums. And I'm like, how can I not have that? What I didn't realize, it was the other track on, on Dune that doesn't have Arthur Brown on vocals. And I'm like, oh, that's a really good track. But the one with vocals is horrible. So you have like half of, the, half of an album is horrible. The other half is really good. And I just had totally ignored the good side because I was so disappointed with the vocals on the other side. Um, so anyway, to get back to Mind Phaser, an album called Mind Phaser that Grammar Vision put out. So this is a domestic Klaus Schultz product. Um, this is weird. This is a compilation album. And here's what's on here. Um, a track called Weird Caravan, which is a uh, 5 minute and 20 second track. And I, I didn't write down, because I have an insert in here where I wrote down where everything's from. I know it's from one of his um, early 80s albums. And I could picture it, but I can't think of the name. And I want to say, I don't know I don't know if it's from Interface or uh, Digit or Dig It. I, I can't remember, but it, it's from one of those, this weird caravan which is a 5 minute and, and 20 second track. Um, there's also a track from Body Love Volume 2 on here, and I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce it. Uh, Muget to Q? Muget is a play on the, on the word move, um, which is a track that appeared in two different versions. There was one on each uh, volume of the Body Love, Body Love Volume 2. Volume 1 had one version. Uh, Body Love Volume 2 had a different version. They stuck the 13 minute and 15 second version of that track from Body Love Volume 2 on here. That's from 1977. They have uh, a track, Some Velvet Phasing, 8 minutes and 30 seconds, from the Black Dance album. Actually, that's the only track from Black Dance I like, um, and that's the one that doesn't have any percussion, uh, you know, no Klaus Schultz playing bongos, or um, vocal snippets or uh, acoustic guitar or anything like that. So to me that was always the best track on the Black Dance album, which was his fourth album. And it has, and it's just really weird, they just threw the stuff together here. The last track is Mind Phaser from the Moon Dawn album, which would be his uh, sixth album. But they only did a ten minute excerpt from it, so not even the whole track, like half the track. Um, so it's a really weird, just thrown together thing, uh, and they probably did that for, for whatever, whatever reason. Maybe they didn't want to do a long side. I don't know. Very strange album. Very, very thrown together. Um, on the Grammy Vision label. Um, and I don't honestly know why I bought it because I, I, I think I had all these tracks. So I, everything else that I have, I think that's all the Klaus Schultz vinyl I have. Everything else I have on CD, and I kind of wanted my focus anyway to be his, his early years. I spilled into a little bit the his second chapter, uh, when his music just started shooting all over the place. Um, and then, you know, you basically get into the third chapter a year or two later, when he really started just getting into the strictly digital uh, synthesizers, and the, the sound of the music changed. And um, he, he, for the most part, dropped the vocal stuff. He did make a bunch of albums in that phase that didn't have drums, but now there were drum sounds on the keyboards that you get that were very realistic sounding like drum kits. Um, and that's a whole nother chapter in his life. I still think his most important work is his, really his first ten albums. And that, those are the ones that I tend to think of, too, uh, when I think of Klaus Schultz, even though I followed his recent stuff and I even... Uh, in the 90s started revisiting him, but those are really patchy albums in the 90s. Um, he's, of course, putting out so much stuff you can't keep up with it now, including 
the whole uh, V Electronic uh, series, which is uh, recorded well, various live recordings and things he did at home that weren't meant to be released. Um, some very interesting stuff, especially the earliest volume one and two, I find on there, uh, as well as continuing to make new albums and um, doing albums with Lisa Gerard, which I'm she's fan yeah, fantastic singer, but. I, I, I still like Klaus on his own, and that's kind of where I prefer to hear him. So, I knew this would be long. Sorry, guys. It's long like a Klaus Schultz album. Um, but, but that's it. I mean, obviously, this isn't a career overview. This is more like my personal uh, introduction to Klaus and my impressions of his earlier work, or certainly the work from his first 15 years, say, um, and the ones that I prefer over the others. Maybe someday I'll, I'll, you know, get into some of his more recent things since the late 90s that I've uh, liked or, you know, albums that I prefer over others or whatever. But um, this is essentially my Beatles video because this is probably the most popular guy that I will ever do a video on. So um, I hope it, it has some value for the folks out there. Um, and... Uh, as always, I really appreciate you watching, and uh, I hope everybody's having a great day, week, weekend, whatever, whenever you see this. Thanks for watching, guys. I will be back all too soon.